Welcome to the Bitter Medicine Podcast, where it's all about black empowerment. Our show focuses on black news and entertainment, arts, science, economics, history, people, and strategies that uplift, empower, and motivate Africans within the diaspora. And now, your host, whose favorite color is black, Goku. to the Better Medicine Podcast. I am your host, Koku. And today we have another topic. Uh, uh, we're discussing the human rights of Africans. We're reading this paper. And before I go on, uh, I just want to shout out the rest of the KWAZ podcast family. Uh, only to say with the pro-black perspective, as well as... Uh, Reese with the Queen's Council and and D Webb and El Miguel and Reese uh, with the Harsh Reality Podcast. We just had this mega show with uh, myself, Only to Say, and the Harsh Reality Podcast crew, which includes Reese from the Queen's Council, and it was a good time. I hope you guys uh, checked it out. I've posted it on social media several times. Hope you guys checked it out. And uh, by all means, make sure you follow uh, the Pro Black Perspective, the Harsh Reality Podcast, and the Queen's Council on social media as well. All right, uh, so kind of got some sinus issues, but let's do it. The Human Rights of Africans. Um, let me find my reading. Okay, Um, by Joy Hendrickson. Introduction. Um, Human rights are generally accepted nowadays as a universal moral standard, and if, uh, if this is the case, then we ought not to speak of the rights of Africans, but only of human rights in Africa. However, if we examine the idea of human rights, leaving aside the practice or non-practice for a moment, we can see that there exists a profusion of varying interpretations of the doctrine. The East and West wage a cold war over the fundamental meaning of human rights concepts. Third world scholars claim that their own version of human rights has, has more to do with collective human dignity than with individual rights. The West is accused of imposing Western standards on non-Western cultures when it attempts to insist that such deviations from the true meaning of human rights are perversions of the doctrine. That makes sense. How then do we deal with the myriad contradictions and general confusion about the meaning of universal human rights? If we distance ourselves from the ideological aspects of the debate and concentrate on what human rights have meant and not on what they should mean, we can see that the idea of human rights has varied throughout history, even in the West. Modern day conceptions of human rights are broader than the original 17th century ideas of natural rights, which are different again from earlier formulations of natural law. The concept of human rights has never been universal in the sense of an idea that is timeless and absolute. There is not one single final true version of the doctrine. Therefore, to avoid charges of cultural imperialism, when one talks of universal human rights, the discussion must include the ideas of non-Western peoples. Only a conglomeration of views from different segments of humanity add up to a truly universal perspective on human rights. Human ideas, uh, sorry, African ideas of human rights are one neglected aspect of the total composite picture. You see, this is the problem when you live in a society where everyone determines everything around you. This is what what I talk about, and I mentioned this on the mega uh, episode of the Harsh Reality Podcast. When in Western culture, Western culture likes to infantilize its people, likes to make them children, right? And 
most people have pretty much accepted it, right? Most people have accepted being treated as, as children. You know, like for example, you look at like uh, a car commercial, like say car insurance, and they got a little uh, cartoon like uh, Gecko selling you car insurance. You know, if you go, if you're old enough to remember back in the day when Penny Hardaway was a basketball player, uh, he um, he um, had this little caricature called Little Penny, voiced by Chris Rock, right? So that's kind of how they always try to 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 dumb you down and make you this, you know, I mean, nothing more than an infant. And the problem with that is that's a Westernized concept. That's this that's this European concept. But as African people, we are men and women. We are men, women, and we are children. Okay? We're human beings. And so we cannot be, you, you cannot tell us, right? And we shouldn't allow anyone to tell us, right? What a human right is for us. That's a major failing on our part. We allow people to name everything around us. There's power in naming stuff. We allow people to, to, to direct us, you know, every which way. We allow too much things to happen. Now we, we are living in a reality where we, we've allowed people to dictate to us what is our natural law, what is our, our, our rights as human beings. It's just madness. And this thing of, you know, trying to appeal to these folks to let them, uh, you know, add your definition of human rights, that's another problem. I, I continue, though. Modern African writers have used the concept of human rights to express their condemnation of the treatment of Africans by non-Africans. These ideas should be examined in their own right and not considered as mere second-class versions of concepts borrowed from the West. In fact, the suggestion an idea is borrowed means that it is merely on loan and must ultimately be returned. To imply that uh, the West owns the concept of human rights is just as unacceptable as the claim that the concept of human rights is a Western-inspired idea or that it originated in the West. And that's absolutely true. You know, in the last couple of episodes, we've been talking about this concept that Africans carry called, you know, called Ubuntu and communalism and where you saw the human nature and the humanness in your neighbor and where you and your neighbors work together to uplift yourselves, each other uh, and the community. The West, and, and its nature of imperialism doesn't carry the same sentiments that Africans carry. So whatever loan words, terms, ideologies you borrowed from them, give it back. Time's up now, give it back. Paul and J. Um, Hound Tanji Echoing the sentiments of many contemporary African scholars declares that Europe certainly did not invent human rights. Ideas of human rights arise at particular historical time periods when the social and economic conditions are ripe enough for their articulation and dissemination. These ideas flourish everywhere and cannot be considered the private property of the West. I mean, just the, just the idea that you have to say that just rubs me wrong. Once it is considered that all concepts of human rights are historical products of particular circumstances, or more specifically, the reaction to certain injustices experienced by people, then it can be seen that African ideas of human rights are equivalent to similar statements made by Americans or Frenchmen. While equal merit may be posited, equal attention has not been given to African ideas. And again, this is this appeal, you know, for others, to, to hear your thoughts. Man, just define human rights according to our traditions and keep it moving. 
This article begins to redress the imbalance with a brief examination of some of the historical documents in which Africans have declared their human rights. Adherents of the view that Africans have an idea of human rights, which is different from the dominant Western version, have indicated that the source of this vision lies in Africa's pre-colonial communal past. Remember, I talked about communalism and Ubuntu. But Rhoda Howard wonders how much of Africa's communal values still persists to warrant the claim of an African approach to human rights that is rooted in the pre-colonial period. And this is, this is where I hope this paper takes us down this interesting path of understanding, right? Further showing you how, you know, if you continued rule in Africa the way the, the colonists ruled Africa, then you you turned Africa into shit, right? Anything that they would do, and if you continued it, you failed your people. If you didn't go back to, commute, to, to the you know, traditional communal values uh, that the people had, you failed your people to continue. Osita, uh, Elsita Ize draws attention to the feudal character of many of the, elder, of the early African societies and advocates a more realistic and less romantic view of Africa's past when searching for evidence of human rights. A more fundamental criticism, like that of Jack Donnelly, denies the existence of ideas of human rights in traditional or pre-modern societies, both in the third world generally and in the West as well. Given the difficulties of proving conclusively whether or not early African societies had concepts of human rights, this article restricts itself to modern African political thought, uh, where there is clear evidence of a particular interpretation of human rights. The article deals specifically with those writings of Africans which are in English and does not discuss the various strands of African political thought which are in French, Portuguese, or stem from the Islamic tradition, which is good, which is good. Because again, and you see that last one, that Islam and, and Christianity, don't, don't think you are above redress here. You see those religions, those two in particular, detrimental to the continent and detrimental to our people historically and contemporarily. And, and, and it's also not great that we're, we're getting this knowledge in, in, in the English tongue as opposed to an African tongue, but we work with what we have. But we definitely don't want it from the French part. I mean, we really don't want it from the English either. But again, you and I, we speak English. So it's useful to us in that sense. African social and political thought, as it, used, as it is used here, refers to the writings of Africans or those with African ancestry. Therefore, it includes important American and West Indian writers who have had a great influence on the subsequent writings of native-born Africans. This article attempts to make an examination of African ideas by analyzing the concept of human rights as it appears in selected documents of modern African social and political thought, beginning with the reminiscences of ex-slaves written in the 18th century up to the OAU's 1981 African Charter on Human and People's Rights. An overview of the development of the human rights of Africans can be seen as a battle which necessarily began as a legal struggle to free the slaves. After emancipation, Afri uh, African demands for rights endured on a social or cultural level as the cry against ra uh, racial discrimination then moved to a political sphere in the fight against colonialism and foreign domination and continues in the economic realm with a call for a new international economic order. From this preliminary investigation of modern ideas, it can be seen that Africans do view rights in collective terms. 
rather than being fundamentally a doctrine which restricts the power of a state, as it does in the West, by protecting the lives, liberties, and property of individuals, human rights in the African context has been a declaration of war against slavery, racism, colonialism, and underdevelopment. And a part of the reason why I'm doing this topic, too, is we recently had uh, this brainstorm, only to say from a pro-black perspective, had this brainstorm where we were discussing, um, you know, some, you know, not, not to spill all the beans, you should have been there, but we, we're discussing some like revolutionary writing type stuff. And, you know, recently in one of the updates, uh, it was discussed about human rights. And something like this, this paper, I think can shed some light and give some ideas to this write-up that we're doing. But this is, this, is, this is a key piece in this paper already that states that, you know, the African uh, context of human rights is based on the declaration of war against slavery, racism, colonialism, and underdevelopment. So if you were on the fence about, you know, maybe I, maybe I want to repatriate to Africa or what have you, and you are on the fence, or if you are on the fence about like, what's the benefit of Pan-Africanism? Well, this, these are these are conceptually the benefits of Pan-Africanism and repatriation, right? Because the fight is for your protection, right? Fundamentally, the idea of the fight is for your protection. To continue, the African idea of human rights develops as a response to these collective injustices and seeks to restrict the power of non-African over Africans. And that's what you want, too. You want to set yourself up. You see, I know it's a tough concept to think about leaving the place that you've only known your whole life. I get that. However, the place that you've known your whole life has been abusing you your whole life, you and your, uh, you know, and the generations before you. And so what you really want ideally is a land where your rights, your, 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 your body, your rights, your, you know, et cetera, is protected. And so you want to work with, uh, you want to work with a collective that's again, remember communalism on Ubuntu. You want to work with a collective that is seeking to, to uplift you as you work to uplift them and everyone has a mutual benefit. And, and, the, and the end result is the benefit of not having to deal with, uh, you know, these, these, these foreign powers, right? These non-African foreign powers over African people. You know, I've heard certain talking, talking heads in black society say things like, what's the sense in going to Africa when the quote unquote right, white supremacists rule everything? You see, you guys put way too much power on the shoulders of, of, of non-African people. The reality is these non-African folks have the power that they have based off of and uh, built on top of the resources in the continent of Africa. Stop giving these folks your power. Stop, stop, uh, stop, stop, um, you know, uh, stop, um, feeling that you're powerless and that there's nothing you can do, right? There's strategies to power, and these are some of these strategies to power. Shout out to Trifmac in the uh, chat room on YouTube here. 
Uh, he said, I've been waiting on y'all to come back with this. Trife Map, we've been back for a little while now. If you look it up, you'll see that we have, um, we've been doing episodes for a little while now, for, for a few months now. We've been back doing a few episodes a week. So make sure to check those out. Give me a thumbs up while you're here, Trife Mac, and share the link with uh, those who you think will benefit from hearing what you know I have to say here on the podcast. So to continue, whether or not this idea of human rights is adequate to deal with the problem of post-colonial Africa is a subject that needs to be more thoroughly investigated. In this article, however, it is argued that Africans do have a right to their own interpretation of universal human rights, and that the emphasis on collective rights over, in, uh, over individual rights does not invalidate their point of view. The examination of the African ideas is concluded with some general remarks regarding the still open debate on the relative merits of individual versus collective rights. So that takes us to the section, Early African Ideas of Human Rights. The first mention of human rights in modern African political thought is found in the, uh, in the abolitionist literature, Thoughts and Sentiments on the Evils of Slavery by Otaba uh, Kuguano and the autobiographical life of, of Oladaj uh, Ikwano or Gustavus Vasa. Uh, the African, oh, okay, Gustavus Vassa, the African, are two texts written by Africans in the 18th century, which provide, hold on, let me, uh, uh, which provide us with an interpretation of human rights, which means nothing less, and at this stage, nothing more than the abolition of the inhumane traffic in slaves. The personal experiences of Vasa, coupled with the learned biblical arguments of uh, Kuguano, make a convincing case against the continua uh, against the continuation of the immoral institution of slavery as uh, a violation of man's most fundamental human rights. The claim to natural rights and common liberties of man is made repeatedly in Kuguano's book to prove that no man should enslave another. All arguments made to justify slavery and the slave trade by excluding Africans from the category of holders of natural rights to life and liberty are refuted. Kuguano states that God gave that God gave to all equally a natural right to liberty. Africans are born as free as Englishmen. Yet we have been robbed of our natural rights as men and treated as beasts. This is no exaggeration. Referring to the, uh, no shit. Referring to the infamous Zong case of 1790, Kuguano tells us that slaves were to be considered the same as horses, and it was therefore legitimate to throw sick ones overboard in an attempt to recover their value from the insurers. Kuguano's books uh, is more of a narrative than Kuguano's work and contains less on the abstract concept of natural or human rights. Uh, thank you, Trife. I appreciate it. However, he does give references to rights or violations of rights from his personal experience. While still a slave, he despaired over ever attaining his rights among men and suspected that he needed to wait until he got to heaven. Although he had the good fortune to be able to purchase his freedom, he soon recognized that this was no guarantee of his rights. After witnessing the seizure by these infernal invaders of human rights of a freeborn young mulatto, Iquano exclaimed, Hitherto, I thought only slavery dreadful, but the fate of a free Negro appeared, in some aspects, even worse. To Iquano, a free Negro is only nominally free. Since his evidence was inadmissible in a West Indian court of law, he could be universally insulted and plundered without the possibility of redress, until not only the slave trade, but also the institution of slavery and the laws which supported the institution were all abolished, no single individual African could enjoy his human rights because his life and liberty were constantly threatened. And that's the thing. That's the little change that the system has kind of offered up here, right? 
I don't know why this is not doing what it's supposed to do. The system has offered up this little change here where you don't you don't feel the daily dread of the slave because you have the mobility, right, to do things that you feel that you want to do. But the reality is, your human rights, you know, the, your, your, your life, your liberty is constantly threatened in this land. Guano shared this necessarily collective perspective on the issue of the human rights of Africans. He said, the emancipation of a few, while ever that evil business of slavery is continued, cannot make that horrible traffic one bit less criminal. And that's a, that's a fun, fundamental concept a lot of us do not understand. Like, if one of us is in bondage, right then we can't be free we cannot be free even if i get out which to bring it into real world terms or to modern day terms let's say i i get rich and i move on up the social ladder if my people are still suffering in the ghetto or under under you know ghetto like conditions i can't be at peace I can't, I'm, I'm not free. My mind is constantly on my people. I'm, I'm, I'm by my people in this instance, I'm talking about like, a, you know, hypothetically, I'm talking about like my family, you know, my mother, my father, my children, you know, siblings, cousins, childhood friends. So just, just freeing one or two knee, and that's how we gotta look at this world. Just because you could look at Oprah or LeBron or someone on TV and they balling out with some money to their name, the majority of us are still under the threat daily of our life and liberty being taken from us. While non-African abolitionists shared the conviction that natural rights meant the elimination of the slave trade, not all who accepted the doctrine at the time saw this as the primary interpretation. The American revolutionaries of 1776 understood it in terms of the right to independence. They used the concept of natural rights to fight against tyrannical rule and to institute their own government. And so right there, there's a lesson, right? The lesson is you don't sit up and, and let no one uh, keep you enslaved, you fight back. I don't know why this thing is not working right. You fight back. That's it. You fight back to get your freedoms. It's, it's just that simple. Like to sit up and just feel like, well, I'm comfortable here and all this old stuff, you know, that's the, that's the game, actually. They want you to feel comfortable while they hold your life and liberty in the balance. While non-African, oh, sorry, I, did I read that already? While non-African abolitionists share the conviction of natural rights, uh, meant the elimination of the slave trade, not all who accepted the doctrine at the time saw this as the primary interpretation. The American Revolu revolutionaries of 1776 understood it in terms of the right to independence. They used the concept of natural rights to fight against tyrannical rule and to institute their own government. There is no evidence to show that either Kuguano or Ikuano uh, agreed with the interpretation. <clears throat> Just like the Americans and later the French, these two African writers understood universal human rights in terms of the particular grievances of their own people. <clears throat> At the time, Kuguano and Ikuano uh, wrote Africans were still sovereign in Africa. At the time that they wrote, Africans were still sovereign in Africa. The West had not yet started to scramble for African soil, only for the bodies of its fair sons and daughters. Once captured or purchased, Africans, unlike the white indentured servants, were declared slaves in perpetu you know, for, forever, in perpetuity. 
Gener generations unborn were condemned to bondage. Natural rights, therefore, meant the claim to freedom for all those members of the Negro race who were unfortunate enough to be forcibly torn from their homeland and hence treated in a manner which was unnatural, cruel, and inhumane. And that <clears throat> is also why it's kind of crazy to kind of wave the flag of America or France or, you know, wherever. The way we're supposed to treat these lands, you get some meager resources and you get out. Not celebrate. For while both Cubano and Iquano admit that their freedom was first violated by fellow Africans, Iquano calls them those sable invaders of human rights, they both appear lenient in their condemnation of these acts. Their true rancor is reserved for the Europeans, who stripped the Africans of all semblance of human dignity and forced him to ask, am I not a man and a brother? And that's an important note right there. Do you, do you guys recognize how important a, a, a note that little passage was right there? I'm not going to get into it because, but the, the truth of the matter is, and I've, I've said it before on this, on this podcast before, but the truth of the matter is that slavery was a phenomenon that was happening all over the world. Uh, chattel slavery, the slavery that was performed here in the West, that was not seen before, to my knowledge, right? The way slavery used to work and for you, for those of you who are biblical people, you you remember reading this in your Old Testament. The way slavery used to work was there was a point in time where you worked for a certain amount of years, and there was a point in time you could get up out of that. You could get up out of it's like debtor's prison. It's like debtor's jail. You could get up out of that. You could even marry the daughter of you know someone who you were previously enslaved to. And this stripping of your humanity. That wasn't the case. And so I think these two Africans kind of let up off of the, what they call the Sable Invaders. I think they let up off of the Africans a little bit. And I think the Sable Invaders are actually Arabs, but they let up off of them, those Africans a bit because the Africans didn't know what was coming down the pipe. But now, the thing is this, though. Those Africans didn't know what was coming. You do. You supposed to know by now, if you make any alliances with these folks, what could happen to you? And so you need to act accordingly. And stop hoping that these people see you as a, as a man and a brother. They won't. They don't. It was the peculiarly cruel nature of the transatlantic slave trade that forced the conscience of the world to begin to question the time-honored institution of slavery. Edward Blyden, a prominent spokesman for his race in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, asserts that the right to hold slaves was deeply rooted in the minds of men until the Negro emancipation first established the principle that no circumstances justify the making or holding of slaves. That's how bad slavery was. However, once emancipated, the former slaves were still not free to enjoy the natural rights and privileges of men. Blyden repeatedly warns Afro-Americans, I am aware that some against all experience are hoping for the day when they shall enjoy social and political rights in this land. He claimed that the effect of Abraham Lincoln's 1863 Emancipation Proclamation was only to set the body free, but the soul remained in bondage, and the intellect, social, and religious freedoms of the American ex-slave has yet to be achieved. Reflect on that. The body was free. 
the soul was in bondage and if we look at what's going on now out here seems to me that the soul is still in bondage when you have groups talking about they are the descendants of american slaves and foundational black americans and all that stuff Blyden strongly believed that Africans would eventually attain this degree of freedom and hence enjoy their total human rights only if they return to their original homeland. Where is that, people? Trife Mark, where is that? If you're still with me? All right. He urged Afro-Americans to join him and build a modern African nation in Liberia. This is your ancestors talking to you. Your ancestors knew the deal. Africa for the Africans. Here, you're gonna be free in body, but you'll never really truly be free. Blyden stressed the importance of a separate racial identity and declared openly that Liberia should not be a replica of the U.S. Quote, we do not want the same thing in Africa that we left in America. Instead, as perhaps the greatest of Africa's cultural nationalists, Blyden was determined to assert the rights of the race to develop its own character, soul, personality, individuality, and even nationality. He loudly proclaimed, we have as much right as any other people to strive to rise to the very zenith of national glory. Right? So, this goes back to previous conversations on this podcast. Right? You do not follow what the colonizers did right so when you go back <clears throat> to africa you don't go to africa with a with an american or a western mindset you don't want that that's only going to bring more destruction right that, that's going to make destruction follow you to the continent you gotta change up and return to your natural way. In the 1900s, other notable Pan-Africanists of the diaspora also spoke of the rights of Africans. The identity of the group demanding its rights continue to be based on a racial rather than a geographical limitation. This can be seen as an outgrowth, not only of common ancestry, but also the shared experience of racial degradation. By the way, you notice Blyden wasn't talking about we built this land and all this stuff. Blyden was like, yo, we gotta go back. We gotta go back. All rights listed in Marcus Garvey's Declaration of the Rights of the Negro Peoples of the World, drafted and adopted at a convention of the United Negro Improvement Association held in New York in 1920. <clears throat> were attacks against the dehumanizing segregation against people of color. In the preamble of the doctrine, the first point made is a complaint that nowhere in the world, with few exceptions, are black men accorded equal treatment with white men. The third right listed serves to sum up the meaning of every one of the best of the rights, 54 in all. It states, that we believe the Negro, like any other race, should be governed by these rights and privileges common to other human beings. According to the Declaration, racial discrimination and the parceling out of the continent of Africa among the European nations have caused the denial of all rights and freedoms which ought to be, a, be accorded to Negroes. In this document, the Negro race demands a right to their history a right to dignity, a right to respect. They only want what is denied them because of their color, unhindered access to public places, to employment, and to equal education, as well as equal protection under the law. So, 
It's interesting that Gavi was. Is it, it, it the interesting thing about Gavi, which again, this is my interpretation of Gavi, based on what I saw <clears throat> Gavi doing. Gavi was connecting <clears throat> African people across the globe. That that was his intention, and it with that intention was also for talented persons across the globe to return to the continent and make it a superpower. And so, <clears throat> um, wherever you were outside of the continent, Gavi was pushing for you to have your equal rights as a human being. But it's important to understand that a part of that, the background to that is that Africa has to be strong. For you as a black, as an African, to go anywhere in the world and be held up or, or just treated equally, there has to be the threat that your homeland will come to your rescue should your rights be infringed upon. To continue, they condemn the uncivilized and barbaric behavior of whites toward the Negro peoples. The declaration makes it clear that violence is justified in the attempt to eliminate the infringement of the rights of Negro peoples. Africa belongs to Africans, and the solemn determination to reclaim the treasures and possessions of the vast continent of our forefathers is recorded in the document. Fundamentally, the Declaration protests against the idea that human rights are reserved for the white man. Negroes must be recognized as fellow members of the human race. W.E.B. Du Bois also fought for the rights of Africans as a racial group. He claimed that the drawing of lines in the on the basis of color and race was not his own idea, but could be attributed to the behavior of whites throughout the world who displayed a disposition not to treat civilized Negroes as civilized, and to consider the Negro races existed in the world chiefly for the benefit of white races. But he sometimes identified similarities with other groups and advocated in 1915 an alliance between white and black labor. At the Pan-African Congress held in Paris in 1919, the first resolution arrived at what was the Allied and Associated Powers establish a code of law for the international protection of the natives of Africa, similar to the proposed International Code of Labor. Now, you know, Du Bois and them was doing this thing 100 years ago. And, you know, their understanding is different from ours. The problem is we use their understanding too much, and we don't use our own. Listen, folks, the idea is this, the European or the Eurasian, however you want to call them, these guys are savage, historically speaking, uh, and even up to today, in some aspects, these guys have been savages to their own people, much less you. They're savages to their own people, much less you. And throw in a economic gain for being savage towards you, that's it. So this appeal to them, you know, at this stage of the game, it's just nonsense. It's just nonsense. The rights of Africans at the 1919 Congress were identified primarily in social and economic terms. Freedoms and political control took a backseat to demands for capital to be regulated and profits to be taxed for the social and material benefits of the natives. These benefits were clearly stated. Education and medical services should be provided by the state. Labor was also to be strictly regulated so that abuses were curtailed. The land was to be held in trust for the natives. It seems that the state was also to be held in trust for the right to participation is limited by the development of the natives. 
with the view toward a future where Africa is ruled by Africans. And all of that kind of talk there, again, that's that infantilization of, of people, right? They did that to the Native Americans too with reparations. They gave the Native Americans reparations, but they held the money like in a trust. A lot of people don't talk about that. A lot of people just talk about the uh, casinos and stuff like that. But a lot of that reparations money was held in a trust because they didn't feel that the Native Americans were capable, right? They weren't developed enough, right? And so these people kind of sunned the Native Americans and they sunned the Africans too. You don't want people sunning you out here. You're not no one's boy. You can take care of yourself. And that's why this pro this project that I'm working on, and I got a sister today who reached out to me about helping. Uh, thanks to that sister as well. I'll talk more about what's going on in another broadcast. But that's why the education is so important. You want your people ready and locked in, ready to go. Right? You don't want no one to ever come along and tell you, well, we don't think you're, you're ready to do this, that, and the other. No, it's about self-determination. That's what your education is supposed to be doing. Your education is supposed to be creating your future leaders, people who won't sell you out. Right? Your education is an indoctrination. Make no mistake about that. Because your miseducation is an indoctrination. When you got people sitting up talking about the white supremacist control of the whole world, that's your miseducation speaking. Your education will tell you now, nah, you are from, your homeland is, is the battery that runs this engine. And you need to be back there in some shape or form, right? And receiving its power. That's our problem. Our problem is we don't have power. And we don't have power because we we didn't because we followed the, the, the colonizers' way of doing things. Our education and all is from them. They're not gonna educate you to be powerful. They're gonna educate you to 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 be on their nuts all the time. Before I go to the next section, let me pause here for a quick uh, station ID break. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. This is DA asking you tuning to the Harsh Reality Podcast, providing you with social commentary on the news affecting our community, only on KWAZ Radio. Peace, family. This is Oni, inviting you to listen to the pro-black perspective, where black problems are addressed with black solutions. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. And we're back. Um, I'm going to continue reading this paper about the human rights of Africans. It's been, it's been a good read so far. I've enjoyed it. Um, I hope you have enjoyed it so far as well. We're at a section of the paper called Right to Independence. However, in the near future, 1945, at the Pan-African Congress in Manchester, rule by consent was no longer the ultimate goal. Constitutional reforms, which allow for greater participation, were considered as spurious attempts to continue the political enslavement of the peoples. Indirect rule was seen as an encroachment on the right of the, of the African natural rulers. Africans and all colonial peoples had a right to control their own destiny. And, and that's the thing, like, you didn't think that 20 years earlier? Or 25 years earlier? It, it's weird some of the stuff that we do, you know, to ourselves. Self-government was the only way to defeat the exploitative intentions of the imperialist powers. Colonial workers and farmers 
were called to join the struggle for emancipation. Intellectuals and professional classes were told that the winning of their own liberties depended upon fighting for trade union rights, the right to form cooperatives, freedom of the press, assembly, demonstration and strike, freedom to print and read the literature which is necessary for the education of the masses. These rights were needed to organize the masses as the only road to effective action. These rights were instrumental in the gaining of the single most important right, the right to freedom, not for individuals, but for a national group. Besides being primarily moral and legal limitations on existing governments, the Western doctrine of the rights of man contains revolutionary elements. The doctrine sees rights as natural and prior to government. Government was instituted among men to protect these rights. If any government failed to carry out the purpose for which it was created by the people, these same people had a right to abolish it. It was this, it was this aspect of the doctrine which appealed most to Africans at this stage of history. Human rights became the platform on which the struggle for independence was fought. The doctrine was used not to restrict the power of the state over individuals, but to overthrow existing foreign control over peoples of a different race and eliminate discrimination on the basis of color. Africans argued that they had a right to overturn colonial government because its politics of racial discrimination and economic exploitation uh, denied Africans their rights. That's the right of self-governance. The logical conclusion was that a new government must be formed which would protect and ensure these rights. However, the emphasis was placed on the right to self-determination as a right in itself and not as a means to, to, to the realization of other rights. And that's a shame. If a government is not only based on the consent of a people, but also created by the people themselves, then Europe was to be reminded that the Africans did not create the colonial governments. Racism, created by the whites, clearly separated two groups, Africans and Europeans. The rule of one over the other is alien rule and must come to an end. Alien rule must come to an end. Africans can never be Europeans because of the color of their skins, therefore Africa can never be part of Europe. A distinct people must rule themselves. They must be able to determine their own destiny, as well as to define their own, as well as to define their own identity, I, I guess is what it meant. It says identify. This is the only way to end the discrimination and exploitation, which denied Africans not only their rights, but even their humanity. You hear a lot of people talking about being a distinct people these days. And the problem with that being a distinct people is you don't you, you you don't control your people. Right? You are being ruled over by someone else, an alien rule. So how are you a distinct people? It, it's just it's just weird. Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Once the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted by, this, by the Security Council of the UNO in December 1948, Africans constantly referred to this document in their struggle for independent status. The final communique of the, of the Conference of Independent States held at Accra in April 1958 proclaims and reaffirms unswerving loyalty to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and reiterates the deeply held conviction that that racialism is a negation of the basic concept of human rights. However, when the conference recognizes the right of African people's independence and self-determination, it is not referring to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. <laughs> what a, wow. The United Nations document does not include a right to self-determination. 
keep that in mind about the U about the UN. It is a declaration of individual rights. Individuals are considered to be born free and equal in dignity and rights, but the acceptance of limitations of sovereignty found in the declaration means the acceptance of the unequal status of certain territories. Of course, this need not, or even must not, excuse denials of rights to individuals in dependent areas. Discrimination against individuals or on any basis, including the political, jurisdictional, or international status of the country to which a person belongs is condemned by the Declaration. However, Africans refuse to accept the claim that individual rights could be observed under conditions of servitude of a people. The colonial powers did not treat Africans as individuals, but as sing a single racial category to be dominated and exploited indiscriminately. Oppression and subjugation of one race by another is clearly a denial of human rights. Make no mistake, when these Africans were, were pushing back against, you know, how, how, how these things were written, these Europeans understood exactly what they were saying. They didn't care. And so this appeal, you know, I've talked about this ever since I started doing this part, this appealing stuff, we gotta stop that stuff, man. Uh, appealing, appealing to me shows fear, right? And that's how most people will take it. If another man is, is beating the shit out of you and you appealing to him, you appealing to some morals, Sense he, uh, sensibilities he might have. Do I need? Do I need to even finish that analogy now? Nah. At the All African People's Conference in Accra in December 1958, the resolutions on imperialism and colonialism, and on and on racialism are rife with references to human rights. The emphasis in this document is on political rights as distinct from fundamental human rights in general. Alongside a right to self-determination and independence is a right to participate in the government of your country. This last right is included in the Universal uh, Declaration of Human Rights and is clearly violated by the colonial policy of denying universal suffrage to Africans. This denial of fundamental political rights to Africans gives the imperialists a free reign to continue their nefarious activities which deprive Africans of fundamental human rights, freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom of movement, freedom of worship, freedom to live a life, to live a full and abundant life, sorry, right? Trying to highlight, I don't know why this thing is not working. Right, that's an important point. And you wanna be in a place where you have these freedoms. If you're listening to this uh, episode, I want you in the, comment section uh i want you to to tell me what do you think is freedom and wherever you are as an african america caribbean the continent of africa wherever you are you know, europe uh do you feel you have true freedom all right and answer honestly and if you do feel you have freedom tell me why and if you don't Tell me why, okay? That's the question of the day for the podcast. Under such circumstances, there can be no other choice but to condemn colonialism and imperialism and to insist upon the right of self-determination for the entire continent and all colonial peoples. On the 14th of December, 1960, the omission of a right to self-determination in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was corrected by 
the declaration of the granting of independence to colonial, to colonial countries and peoples. This declaration stated as its first principle, the subjugation of people to alien subjugation, domination and exploitation, consists of denial of fundamental human rights. Article two of this declaration later becomes the first article in the two international covenants formulated in 1966 to give effect to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Both the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights began with the words, all peoples have a right to self-determination. By virtue of that right, they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic and social and economic development. So this is why, like, historically, you see black folks trying to take a case to the UN. Dude, <laughs> the UN is a conglomerate of these European powers. The same ones who colonize you, who colonize your countries, same ones who participated in the slave trade. Like, come on. They're just giving you lip service when they do this type of stuff. African constitutional rights. This is the next section. Um, if you, I see there's some new people listening in in the chat. If you're listening in, by all means, drop a comment. Let people know you were here. Make sure to give us a thumbs up. All of those types of things are important. Thumbs ups, comments, etc. Uh, it helps the algorithm uh, determine who to show the episode to, who to preview the episode to, et cetera. It also helps us as a channel in terms of building and branding, et cetera. So please make sure you give it a thumbs up, make sure to share it with people who you think will appreciate the information. So African constitutional rights. <clears throat> African and colonial peoples won their battle for the acceptance of the right to self-determination as a universal right. And in the years that followed, many African states uh, gained independence as well. The stage was set for the realization of the rights of Africans free from foreign domination and the, per and the, pernicious, and the pernicious effects of racism. Most of Africa was now in control of the governmental apparatus, which could deny a people civil and political freedoms. Nearly all the constitutions of the newly independent states declared allegiance to the principles of human rights. Often these declarations of rights were found in the preamble or in some other non-enforceable form as in the president's oath of office in Ghana's Republican Constitution of 1960. Wow, that's, that's an interesting line right there. That's an interesting line right there. So these, these statements about being for human rights we usually stated in areas where the law couldn't enforce anything that was said. Uh, Nigeria, however, was the first African nation to include a Bill of Rights as a substantive, see, because that's what I was expecting. Not just a statement on it, but a bill, right, a law. So Nigeria, however, was the first African nation to include a Bill of Rights as a substantive provision in its constitution. Rather than the absolute declaration of rights found in many of the former French colonies, uh, independence constitutions, Nigeria had a more modern bill of exceptions where numerous limitations on the rights guaranteed by the constitution were spelled out in detail. While Tafua 
uh, Bellower remarked at the Lagos Conference on the rule of law in 1961 that, quote, we felt that human rights was a subject of such tremendous importance that they should not be left hidden here and there in a legal maze. And we insisted on having a special chapter of our constitution devoted to the exposition of those fundamental human rights. Most sources cite the origin of Nigeria's Bill of Rights as the Willink Commission, commonly referred to as the Minorities Commission. On the verge of the independence based on majority rule, fears for the rights of minorities surfaced. Nigeria's Bill of Rights was included in its constitution and came into force prior to independence in order to be used for the elections in 1959. Africans were quick to realize that a people can be denied rights by members of their own race, and not only through subjugation to alien rule. That's the sucker shit that we gotta fix. The struggle for rights was still conceived of in terms of groups rather than rather than individuals, but with the imminent departure of the of the colonialists, the the, the boundaries of the group to which one belonged had to be redrawn. In Nigeria, the, this redefinition of boundaries took the form of a request for new states within the federal structure. In 1958, a commission of inquiry headed by Henry Willink was set up to investigate the fears of minorities and, and to suggest ways of, of allaying such fears. Representations were made to the commission requesting the formation of additional states to safeguard the liberties of minorities who fear discrimination after independence once the indigenous majorities gain control over each of the regional governments. The commission concluded that the balance between regional and federal institutions should be adequate to deal with this problem. National leaders would be forced to represent the interests of minorities in order to gain enough votes for election to federal institutions. The police would also be an arm of the federal government, and this will help minimize possible infringement of minorities' rights. The commission refused to recommend the creation of new states. You see, this goes to the last episode, right? If you haven't checked out the last episode, make sure you do. Uh, where we talked about communalism and pan-Africanism. Again, if you followed what the, uh, if you followed what the colonizers did when they had rule over you, you're only gonna lead your country into further destruction. In fact, you know, it could be argued that they, 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 they didn't leave, you know, the colonizers when they left, they didn't leave nations anyway, right? So you really needed to build your nation from the ground up and consider all aspects of the situation when building the nation. But if you just went and did the shit that they did before, remember when they when they had these land grabs and cut up these places and called them Nigeria and all this stuff, these guys were mixing in territories and these borders that weren't necessarily friendly people. And by the way, that's not an African thing to be unfriendly. What I mean really is that's not only an African thing, that's a human thing. Different peoples move with different peoples or, or tribes or what have you. you. You can't find no more violence between tribes than in Europe. What do you think Rome was afraid of before it fell? It was afraid of those dudes up north who would become the Germans and the Russians and all. It was afraid of them dudes coming down and sacking Rome. And their fear was realized Rome was sacked, fell to these barbarians, and they entered into the Dark Ages. You cannot, you cannot just group different groups of people in these artificial borders, call it a nation when in 
when the when the colonizers never really made it a nation, and then you follow those same steps as the colonizers, right? It, it's just destruction. You're gonna have a problem. Religious delegations were also given a hearing. It was these groups only that suggested the inclusion of a Bill of Rights to safeguard their rights to worship and to proselytize. The Commission seized this opportunity to recommend the Bill of Rights and suggested a textual borrowing from the European Convention of Human Rights. Golly, boy. The example of the origin of Nigeria's fundamental human rights provision in his constitution confirms the idea that Africans were still fighting for collective group rights, even on the advent of colonial withdrawal. The minorities were demanding their right to self-determination, albeit on a lesser scale than independent status at the international level. The fact is that their fears of discrimination took the expression of a request for autonomy of the group and not the protection of individual rights. Even the religious delegations were more interested in the right to establish religious institutions than in a personal than than in personal religious freedom. That's the thing. Like, you know, people do tend to look out for their group, but there's a short sightedness in looking out for the group because you forget about the individual. You see what I'm saying? While you're worrying about getting certain things attached to the group name, you forgot about the little names in the group. And we, uh, we are making those same mistakes when we divide ourselves into groups. When we divide ourselves into groups, trust me, most of the individuals are swallowed whole. We gotta start thinking about the people the individuals that make up the group. So minority rights. Minority rights are collective rights. They had a right to fully to full equality with the majority and the, per, and the preservation of the separate identity of the minority. That's interesting, okay. They give rise to the right to establish, manage, and control charitable, religious, and social institutions, schools, and other establishments using the language of the minority and freely exercising religious uh, precepts of the group. The right of, of an individual to be free from discrimination or to be treated equally is not the same as the right of a group to equal status with the dominant group. Got to highlight that. That is, that is well stated. Groups are trying to be, you know, on par with what they consider or what they see as the dominant group. But that means nothing for the individual, really. Right? The individual can still suffer. The idea of equality of the individual whitewashes differences. It is an equality which requires everyone to become like the dominant group by disassociating himself from the inferiority from the inferior minority. The individual is expected to melt into the larger whole. During the colonial period, this could only be attempted but not accomplished by a schizophrenic act described by Franz Fanon as the wearing of white masks over black faces. This experience taught Africans to be wary of an individual freedom and equality, which can also be purchased at the price of, repudi of repu repudiation of one's past and one's culture. <laughs> to, to consider rights in collective terms means to fight for the continued existence of the group. The group asserts its right to remain a distinct and separate entity and to preserve its identity as such. But the Willing Commission was convinced that to allow states to be created on the basis of ethnicity would be to perpetuate differences destined to wither away. This is an odd comment from a people who believe that democracy means tolerance of diversity and competition in a pluralistic society. It is also, that's nothing but a word right there. 
It is also a turnabout on earlier colonial policy, which encouraged the development of ethnic differences and tribal institutions because they were the natural expressions of a people's innate genius. Nevertheless, the British gave Nigeria its substantive Bill of Rights on an individual basis by copying it from the European Convention on Human Rights with minute changes of wording. God damn. Well, uh, our people are short-sighted as a mofo, ain't they? Damn. Hindsight helps to deepen the impression that the Willing Commission was exceedingly unresponsive to the desires of the Africans who testified before them in 1958. The difference between collective group rights and individual rights is more fundamental than any possible legal di distinction between the phrases justifiable and necessarily justifiable in a democratic society. Let me read that last sentence one more time. The difference between collective group rights and individual group rights is more fundamental than any possible legal distinction between the phrases justifiable and necessarily justifiable in a democratic society. This section is called Collective Rights. While the Universal Declaration of Human Rights lists nearly 30 individual rights, modern law vouchsafes three collective human rights to peoples. These are the right to physical existence, to self uh, two, to self-determination, and three, to utilize natural resources. The fight for the rights of Africans can be seen as a struggle for these three collective rights. The right to physical existence, besides being a prohibition against genocide, entails the right to a separate identity. This expresses the social and cultural aspects of the fight against racism. Racism denies black men respect and dignity by, deny, by, the, by denying them a positive identity of their own mass, of their own making, sorry. Think about that. Racism denies black men respect and dignity by denying them a positive identity of their own making. While that is somewhat true, it's a problematic statement because it implies uh, that it implies like, um, what's the word I'm trying to find? Um, it implies that your your respect and dignity as a man is in relation or or, or depends on like being in the vicinity to others, right? So it's 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 in relation to another man's respect and dignity. And I have a big problem with that. We decide, right? We decide our respect and dignity and more importantly, we give that and show that to each other. We don't have to do that through the lenses of whiteness or Europeanness or, or you know or Eurasianness or what have you. That's the that's what that's a big problem that we have. Listen, if a white guy wants to be quote unquote racist towards me, let him. He could try. Right? But what we're working towards is being able to, you do you, big fella, I'm gonna do me. I'm, a, I'm still a man, I still stand on my own two feet. I got my respect, I got my dignity. I, 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 I show that respect and dignity to my brother and my sister around me. Do you. You see, we gotta practice more nationalism in that respect. The white guy practices his nationalism. I do not agree with the idea that white nationalism is supposed to commit evil. You can do, you could be proud of your whiteness and build your nation over on the side there. Just fucking leave me alone. Leave my people alone. But that's not what they're doing, so we gotta move accordingly. 
To continue, once slavery was abolished, Africans demanded a right to practice their culture, to learn their history, a right to be black and still be considered as equal members of the human race. Then the struggle progressed to the political stage where Africans demanded not only the right to define themselves, but to rule themselves as well. Eventually, the colonialists were forced to concede the right in self-determination to nearly all of the African peoples. The third right to utilize your natural resources appears to originate from the demands of colonial uh, peoples. It is an expression of the collective social and economic rights of a people which are being fought for today under the banner of the new international economic order. Section called a right to development. When Africans demanded the right to political control over their nations, they expected to gain economic control as well. Independence had been sought as a road to the end of foreign exploitation and the beginning of, na of national development. Ah. However, after the initial euphoria created by the winning of independence died down, it soon became apparent that civil and political freedoms were not sufficient to bring about the desired transformation of the continent and its peoples. Economic ties still constituted a bondage Right, to the interests of the ex-colonial powers. And that, because of that, that's why a lot of you think well, the white man is all powerful. But the reality is if you cut, if you cut the tie, <clears throat> you cut the power, right? You cut that cord, you cut the power. A right to development for the African people was seen as being sabotaged by continued economic dependence upon the international economic order, which maintained low prices for raw material and high prices for manufactured goods. Unequal exchange resulted in unequal development and the social and economic rights of Africans were still being denied even after political independence had been Granted, sorry. <clears throat> what is needed now <clears throat> is a new international economic order to redress the imbalance caused by years of, of exploitation and drain on the economies of the third world. Through their involvement in non-aligned movement, Africans took part in the formulation of the demand for a new international economic order. Protests against the stark inequalities that exist between rich and poor nations began at Bandung and crystallized at the 1973 Algiers summit of the non-aligned heads of state and governments, where a specific call was voiced for a new international economic order with concrete suggestions regarding implementation. Africans recognized the connection between the need for a change in the world economic system and the possibility of the realization of fundamental human rights for people of the third world. At the Buter Colloquium on Human Rights and Economic uh, Development in Francophone Africa, held in Rwanda in July 1978, Africans made an explicit call for a new international economic order, which would mean a more equitable distribution of the world's economic power as an essential precondition of economic development and the guarantee of human rights. I mean, do you guys see the problem with this stuff, man? <clears throat> this is our history. This is our recent history. <laughs> and we still do this kind of stuff. Like, I'm sorry to tell y'all again, Sorry to be that broken record, but power is taken. People don't share power. The colloquium asserted that fundamental human rights include social and economic rights, and these cannot be realized without a prior right to development for people in the third world. Therefore, a right to development must be held Sorry, to be a fundamental human right in itself. A right to development must be held. I mean, yeah, but you're asking people's permission. 
Given the conditions in the Third World, to deny a collective right to development of a nation based on the unhampered utilization of its natural resources would be to deny individuals social and economic rights. The realization of social and economic rights of Africans necessitates not only the recognition of a right to development, but the realization of the fact of development, and this cannot be accomplished without the emergence of a new international economic order. And I disagree. Um, if you're listening live or you, 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 you listen to the playback, comment, do you believe that some bargaining of a new international economic order, you do, do you think that would even happen? Do you think folks who have power are going to are going to step down to give you to to, to you know to, to to allow you to step up? It's begging. It's begging. African shot on human and people's rights. The battle for rights of Africans is still being fought, no doubt. Elements of the early stages of the struggle are still apparent in more recent documents. The Africans' charters on human and people's rights adopted by the OAU, Council of Ministers and Assembly of Heads of States and Governments in Nairobi in June 1981, contains elements from the stages of the struggle for the collective rights of Africans. The title alone demonstrates the emphasis not on individuals, but groups of peoples. The desire to maintain a separate cultural identity and to fight against racist ideas of the inferiority of the African are to be found in statements made in the preamble referring to the need for Africans to inspire and categorize their reflections on the concept of human and people's rights by taking into consideration the virtues of their historical tradition and the values of African civilization. Article 1 of the Charter merely calls members to recognize and undertake to adopt legislation which will guarantee the following list of rights. Articles 2 and 3, which we can assume are of primary interest, since they are the first rights listed, are the right to freedom from discrimination in terms of rights and before the law. The emphasis is still on the elimination of racial inferiority as a precondition to the realization of rights. This point appears to be so important that it necessitates repetition in the Charter, Article 19 states, all people shall be equal. Like, at some point, this is just, this is just rhetoric and repetition. Right? Article 20 is, the right to freedom from colonial domination. While this article also repeats the formula used in the two UNO covenants of 1966 for the right to self-determination, two adjectives, unquestionable and inalienable, have been added as a means to give additional emphasis to this declaration of freedom from alien rule. It's just, this is just ridiculous. <clears throat> Earlier OAU documents give an even clearer indication of the supreme importance of this right to the organization uh, and to the African peoples. Barami uh, Indaya argues that in the founding chart of the OAU, there is a dichotomy between the right of peoples to self-determination and all other human rights. The right to self-determination is not primarily an instrumental right, a prerequisite for the protection of human rights. Rather, it is the only right that is assigned importance by the founding charter. Human rights in this document are merely listed under the heading of purposes, and member states are under no obligation to implement. You see, this is... You know, it's frustrating to read this stuff. However, member states are, are obliged to respect the right of a people to self-determination by recognizing sovereignty and independence of all member states. The omission of a commission 
on human rights from the list of five specialized commissions set up the original charter is rectified by 1981 charter of human rights and people's rights but this does not upset the balance in favor of collective political freedom or self-determination over all other human rights the 1981 charter lists social and economic rights alongside civil and political liberties as is found in United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, but it's seldom found in constitutional declarations of rights, including those in African constitution. I mean, it's, I mean, you know, this is why, you know, in the, in the chat room the other day when I was doing my last episode on communalism and pan-Africanism, you know, only I say from the pro-black perspective here on KWAZ Radio uh, said like, definitely the paper said it and he 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 echoed the sentiment like, you are the, the, the African elders, our elders sold us out, man. The preamble to the 1981 charter asserts that economic, social and cultural rights cannot be dissociated from and are a guarantee for the enjoyment of civil and political rights. This emphasis on economic and social foundations leads to a conviction that it is essential to pay particular attention to the collective rights of development. Article 21 states that peoples freely dispose of their wealth and natural resources and asserts that states must endeavor to eliminate all forms of foreign economic exploitation. Article 22, specifically and unequivocally claims a right to development. Okay. Collective rights versus individual rights. Let's talk about it. Let me check the chat room real quick. All right. I guess it's me and Trife Mac here. Collective rights versus individual rights. While individual rights and collective rights are found side by side in the 1981 Charter of the OAU, this fact does not detract from the importance of collective rights in African political thought. Proponents of collective rights often include individual rights in their understanding of freedoms. Usually it is the Western advocates of individual rights who exclude collective rights, and often social and economic rights as well, from their conception of rights. They claim that rights own, can only be individual in nature. What is important is that Africans do not accept this exclusive view of rights as pertaining to individuals alone. Instead, they predominantly see rights in terms of the rights of collectives. This is actually a rare, uh, sorry, this is actually a more realistic appraisal of the idea of rights. Individuals exist not in abstract, but as members of particular groups. One cannot, meaningf one cannot meaningfully discuss an individual outside the context of the group to which he or she belongs. I don't know if that's true. Individual rights are always accorded to individuals belonging to particular groups. The origin of Western individual rights can be traced to the theory of natural rights, which spoke of rights which were supposedly innate and universal, but were incapable, oh sorry, but were applicable only to men of property. Constitutional rights in the US were originally the rights of gentlemen and not of all Americans or mankind generally. You see, th th this is the problem. It doesn't have to be one or the other. There's not. It doesn't have to be this hard line of, well, these guys looked at the rights of individuals and that was bad, and so we just look at the rights of the collective. Nah. Nah. The European Convention on Human Rights was called a Declaration of the Rights of the European Man by Leopold Senghor because it specifically excluded the non-metropolitan territories from its field of operation. Struggles had to be waged throughout history to expand the boundaries of those considered eligible to demand rights. Rights are more of an honor to be earned or status to be achieved than an innate characteristic present at birth. The prize is admittance 
into group or uh, into group of rights holders and the conferring of the title of individual to those who merit it. But to speak of a universal individual is to expand the boundaries of the one's exclusive group to include all of mankind. If this is done without re redefining the, per the perimeters of the group so that others are actually included, it is merely an exercise in int intellectual arrogance or cultural imperialism. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights claims to be the highest aspiration of mankind. However, mankind is understood as male, white, Western, and of a certain class, the inclusion of individuals who fall outside the category is problematic. Unless a redefinition uh, takes place, a woman, a colored person, a poor person, can only gain entrance to the exclusive club of mankind by ceasing to be what he or she is. While it is possible to change one's religion, political beliefs, or nationality, the issues of race and sex are immutable. The problem is not the failure of those who already enjoy rights to live up to the ideal of treating everyone as an individual, disregarding the alien shell and concentrating on the inner similarities. This type of criticism can easily be dismissed by arguing that ideals are unattainable aspirations and rights holders are only human. The end result, <clears throat> the end result of this line of attack is a, it's a continuation of the status quo. The real problem is that particular groups are not accepted for what they are or recognized as containing individuals within the separate and distinct group. So this is what I'm talking about here, right? What I'm talking about here, what I'm personally referring to and talking about most here is that, again, of course you represent the group, but you don't represent the group over individuals, right? Individuals make up the group. They make up the separate and the distinct group, right? But when you're comparing it to say uh, the dominant group or something, you know, comparing the, the group to the dominant group, sure. But you cannot forget the individuals. To continue, therefore, the only way to effectively fight for inclusion in the category of rights holders is to fight for the rights of a group. Peace and harmony, both within and between nations, depend not on equal individual rights, but on equal collective rights. Okay, yeah, equal collective rights, true, right? But I guess what I'm talking about, what I'm trying to say is, if you're nation building, you and if we're nation building in our traditional way, we don't forget the individuals, is my ultimate point. If Africans were ever to have right in any meaningful sense of the term, it was and is imperative to fight first against slavery and racism, to fight for self-determination, and, and for a new international economic order. The rights of Africans. The fight against racism, and particularly the apartheid regime in South Africa, continues to be part of the struggle for the recognition of the human rights of Africans. One wonders how the extension of rights to people of color can be questioned by societies which are now considering the possibility of extending rights to animals and fetuses. It is also surprising to read Lewis Hankins' argument that Americans did not use and abuse human rights to justify a prior right to self-determination as Africans did. Rather, farmers, uh, oh, sorry, rather framers of the U.S. Constitution were expressing what was real or in the air at the time of the American Revolution when they set out a Bill of Rights. God damn. This argument uses the erroneous idea that individual rights are morally superior to collective rights in order to promote the position that universal rights are only found in the air one breathes in America and not in Africa. I mean, but we know that's nonsense. Uh, anyway, the tendency to look skyward and the fear to look at the ground could also explain why Americans 
generally fail to see social and economic rights. Individual rights exist as castles in the air and the social and economic foundation necessary for the full enjoyment of such rights for all is neglected. Certain social and economic changes must take place before the individual human rights can be applied to everyone and will cease to be a category which always excludes some groups, for example, blacks, women, and the poor. Africans are more aware of the conditions necessary for the realization of rights and know from experience that poverty as well as racism is a negation of all human rights. According to, Ju to Julius uh, Neyere, poverty must be abolished because the peasant's right to dignity becomes a fact of human dignity. Neyere, poverty must be abolished before the peasant's right to dignity becomes a fact of human dignity. But even those theories in the West who recognize social and economic rights are reluctant to apply the idea of an international to apply the idea on an international scale. D.D. Raphael argues that social and economic rights, while worthy of the label rights, can be distinguished from earlier ideas of liberties because they can only be demanded from your own nation. They are the rights of a citizen rather than the rights of a man. Apparently, to see social and economic rights in collective terms as a demand for redistribution of wealth through a new international economic order, one needs to be a member of a nation which cannot at present satisfy the social and economic needs of all peoples, <clears throat> whether it is their right or not. This is why you can't, you can't follow these folks, man. We're about to hit the conclusion. Uh, let me Take a quick station ID, get a sip of water. We'll be right back. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. This is DA asking you to tune into the Harsh Reality Podcast, providing you with social commentary on the news affecting our community, only on KWAZ Radio. Peace, family. This is Oni, inviting you to listen to the pro-black perspective where black problems are addressed with black solutions. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. All right, welcome back to the Bitter Medicine Podcast. We're about to conclude this paper that we've been reading, <clears throat> talking about um, the human rights of Africans. Um, some things I agree with, some I don't. Um, you tell me how you feel about the paper in the comment section, okay? In the conclusion, the idea of rights found in the declarations and writings of African peoples is fundamentally expressed in collective terms. That might be true, but again, again, I'm saying that it doesn't, it doesn't ignore or deny the individual. However, the difficulties experienced by Africans in realizing individual rights within the framework of the independent nation states of Africa should not be attrib attributed to the theoretical predominance of collective rights over individual rights. To assume that the emphasis on collective rights causes the denial of individual freedoms is to accept an irreconcilable contradiction between collective rights and individual rights. This approach is consistent with the Western idea of individual rights, which sets the individual above the society and against uh, the state in an adversary relationship. Africans are less likely to view an individual in such an isolated manner. Hmm. The OAU Charter I, I, okay, the OAU Charter on Human and People's Rights contains a separate listing of duties which are more than the observance of the rights of others. Africans have an obligation to the group, the community, and the nation, which is different from an obligation to other individuals within the nation. So, okay, that I get. That I get, because if you have... 
if you have obligations instead to individuals within the nation, like certain individuals within the nation, so so perhaps this is what he's talking about. If you have obligations to certain individuals, let's say the rich, right, then the collective suffers. What, what I was talking about more so than not is that the collective is made up of the individuals and you should, what I'm really saying is you should look at the rights of every individual and it should be the same. That's what I'm saying. What they're, what they're saying in a roundabout way is, well, what the African doesn't want to do is put the rights of you know, certain individuals above the collective. Right, and that's that's completely fair. That makes sense. But when, but what I'm saying is that when you're talking about rights, my right should be equal to your right, and no individual right should be above the nation. Right? Westerners would do well to aspire to an idea of rights which eliminates the stock dichotomy or at least minimizes the antagonism between the individual and large group. So that's what you see like in America, on the West, right? As they stated there, like the, the rich person in America has more rights than I do, right? A white boy was caught in the act of raping a woman in America. I mean, literally caught with his pants down, right? Raping a woman. And the judge looked at him and looked at his uh, his resume, so to speak, his life resume, and said, well, I don't want to ruin your life. And he gave him something like three months, which he served maybe a month or three weeks or something like that. Whereas had I been caught, well, let me not even put myself, because I don't do no dumb shit like that, but had, one, had someone who looks like me, or looks like you listening, had done that, they would be buried under the jail. They would have the proverbial book thrown at them. But because this white boy came, well, number one, because he was a white boy, and number two, because he came from some affluence, right? He, he had a different set of rights from the rest of us. And so yeah, the Africans want to, we as Africans want to avoid that type of dumb shit, but we do want to respect the individual rights of everyone and have it on, on, on even par, right? Surely violations of individual rights to freedom in Africa cannot be explained by the so-called alien nature of the idea of rights to the individual, because an idea or lack of it cannot be the cause of, of, of a phenomenon. Ideas are reflections of experience, and the emphasis on collective rights can be understood as a reaction to slavery, racism, colonialism, and underdevelopment. Rather, gross violations of individual rights must be blamed on the unjust structures existing, but within a society and at the international level, and not on the legitimate values and aspirations of the peoples of Africa and the third world. And that's the conclusion of the paper. Um, for you guys listening, live or otherwise, what were your thoughts on this paper? That, that kind of took like a, a kind of historical approach of talking about human rights for Africans. And, uh, you know, they, they made some valid points. Um, They could have stated some things a little bit better, but ultimately, I, I guess they made some sense in that as Africans, we definitely don't want to have this American situation where because you have a little access and a little money, your rights are preserved or even uh, improved. And because I don't, my rights are infringed upon, right? Um. We definitely want to make sure that everyone, because that's the thing about when you look at it just as nations and you forget the individual that make up the nation, but every individual should have the same equal rights, equal rights and justice, right? Uh, make sure you guys um, 
head over to the Hot Reality Podcast. They're now on YouTube. You can look at look up episode 15. That's the one where I'm a guest, as well as only to say from the pro black perspective. Check it out. Uh, leave comments. Let people know that you listened. Uh, also, I'm continuing my work with the curriculum. Uh, I'm starting to get some help. It seems. Let's see how it goes. Hopefully it all goes well, but more of you can help. Those of you with expertise in building curriculums, those of you with expertise as teachers, those of you with expertise in um, <clears throat> in some of the trades, non-vocations who want to get in here and, and, and help our children learn how to solve their own problems, right? to help uh, create a curriculum that actually captures the attention and the imagination and the motivation of our students, of our children, uh, so that we can have a better future, one with more patriotic leaders who understand the community, who understand the humanness of our people, and who understand that we need a powerful nation to be able to thwart the attempts of other nations from destroying our people, from destroying our nation, right? If you want to be a part of something like that, there's two things you can do. You can join me um, in terms of building this curriculum, and you could join Onita Say in the, the the movements that he's making for 2021. We gotta we gotta start building uh, our people up uh, mentally. We got to get them, for lack of a better word, on code. And right now he's working on some literature that can be uh, used as presentations to pass around to our people to get them in the right mindset. Because all of this stuff that we're talking about is you have to be in the right mindset. The first set of African leaders who took over from the colonizers were in the wrong, most of them were in the wrong mindset. The education was bad. They got it, they were educated and reveled in the education from the colonizers. And so they carried out the colonizers ways and kept Africa messed up. We gotta change that. When we, cha when we tell our students, when we tell our children, we show them and teach them how to figure it out, how to look at a problem, how to solve it, right? When you instill that in them from young, you're gonna have the future leaders who will fix the problems in the future as well. So if you wanna be involved, hit me up. You can email me at bitter.medicine.podcast at gmail.com. I'm also on, a, uh, in addition to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, I'm also on a bb2me.com. On a bb 2 TV, I'm looking to put out some original content on that platform. Um, I have the idea already. I just need a person to help carry it out. Um, so I'm in the search of that person on that site. Um, so look out for the work that's coming ahead. And don't just be receivers or observers of other people's work, right? Get involved. Because the work is for you. The work is for you, your children, your future generations. Get involved today. Let that be your legacy that you got involved. Okay? Uh, until next time, maybe Thursday. I think I'm going to try a Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday schedule. Uh, maybe Thursday we'll be back again with another episode. Until next time, guys. Peace. Thanks for listening to the Beta Medicine Podcast with your host, Koku. If you like what you just heard, we hope you pass along our web address, betamedicineblogs.com, to your friends and colleagues, and share our show to all your social media. Be sure to check out our archive section on our website for previous podcasts. This has been a KWAZ radio production. Join us next time for another session of the Beta Medicine Podcast. Follow us on Facebook at Beta Medicine Show, Twitter, Beta Meds, Tumblr, Beta Meds, 
Instagram Bitter Medicine 